Uh, so my little presentation is called Berlin Alexanderplatz Media Make the City. And what I want to highlight is that this novel is constructed of building blocks taken from popular culture, taken from the culture that people would encounter in Berlin in their everyday lives in the late 1920s. Some of it's very old, some of it's very new. It consists of oral culture. You will have noted that there are storytellers, there are sayings, there are children's rhymes, there are songs, both traditional and current hits. You also have very old types of performance like street singers and hurdy-gurdy players. One problem, by the way, of course, of reading this novel in translation is that um, people who are reading it in German will recognize what's a commonplace saying, what's a children's rhyme, what's an old and a new song. Uh, sometimes from this translation, it might be evident, it might not be. But to any German language reader, uh, these building blocks of the novel are very obvious. Then you have a lot taken from print culture, certainly from the Bible. And remember, ever since the Protestant Reformation, German-speaking Christians, at least if they were Protestant, were expected to read the Bible, and they did, which is one reason why there's so many Bible quotations. Of course, there are also newspapers, uh, which newspaper clippings are to suffuse this novel. In fact, if you go to the, the Dublin archive in Germany, the uh, manuscript for Berlin Alexanderplatz includes a lot of newspaper clippings. He was writing along and then inserted an actual newspaper clipping. Uh, and those should be very obvious as you read the novel. He also quotes from handbills and posters. And then you have the most modern mass media. There are film, the gramophone, the radio, which also feed into this novel. Now, one couldn't write an entire book just analyzing the whole novel in terms of these building blocks. We don't have that time today. So I'll just highlight a couple of um, these things. Well, first of all, I'd like to mention that as soon as the novel appeared in print in 1929, reviewers immediately noticed that these were the building blocks of the novel. Walter Benjamin wrote in his review, that it consisted of, quote, petit bourgeois pamphlets, tales of scandal, accidents, sensations of 1928, folk songs, advertisements, Bible verses, statistics, hit songs. Or Ephraim Frisch, writing in the Frankfurter Zeitung, uh, says, uh, with the words of post, <coughs> electric light ads, newspaper headlines, with the verses of hits, innovative developments are brought to the surface, and exterior events are cast as signs into the interior. Dublin does not scorn the cliche, for the cliche is the means whereby impressions imprint themselves onto people in the big city. I like the first sentence very much, because um, what, he's, what the, um, the reviewer is saying, and I think it's very true of the novel, is that Dublin believes that all of these messages coming from the outside in the metropolis, in the big city, are suffusing our consciousness. They're making, the, they're making up the consciousness of people like Franz Biberkopf. And that also explains the narrative structure of the novel. As you're reading along, there are shifts from one sense to the next between the narrator, between what Biberkopf or someone else is thinking, uh, a message coming from the outside. There, there are no signals that you're shifting from one to the other. You're just reading along as in a stream and this also implies that there really is no interior exterior. There's a continuum between what's going on in one's mind and the messages that are coming from the outside world. Now, um, and this is what interested Dublin. Dublin, uh, when he was in high school and school, he never liked Goethe, he never liked Schiller, he never liked the German classics. He was always drawn to popular culture. In 1910, when he is, after all, what, 32 years old, he says, I have become accustomed to quench my artistic thirst, faute de mieux, in cinemas, variety shows, and circuses. Now, faute de mieux is important because he's saying it's not as if he likes everything that's, you know, in the cinemas, variety shows, and circuses, but he's saying it's better than anything offered by high culture. Now, let's just, you know, pick up cinemas. In 1913, he says that, um, authors should have what he calls a kinostil, a, cinema, a cinematic style. It was actually a very, something very radical. Now, what did he mean by that? You have to imagine cinemas 
the way they were in 1910. Don't think of the late 1920s cinemas. Think of cinema in 1910. It's only around 1910, 11, 12 that feature films started. You know, these hour length films that tell a story. In 1910, you still had uh, what in America were called Nickelodeons. You would have to stay collection of three to 15 minute uh, shorts. And so what would a film program be in 1910? Uh, this is one, musical piece, current events, something humorous, drama, something comic, nature scenes, something comic, the big attraction, something scientific and boisterous comedy. Now, this sounds an awful lot like the novel Berlin Alexanderplatz, doesn't it? You're just constantly shifting from something humorous to something serious, from fiction to fact. And there, if there is a film aesthetic to Berlin Alexanderplatz, then it's actually a Nickelodeon aesthetic, an aesthetic of, the ter of uh, what you would see in a cinema at the turn of the century. Um, uh, Dublin also, uh, films were developed in the 18, were invented in the 1890s, and then by the 1920s you get to radio. And Dublin was a big fan of radio. He tinkered with radio sets. Um, uh, here's a photo on the left. I also have it on the title of my book. Um, the only reason why I'm showing you my book is because I wrote a book about the three versions of Berlin Alexanderplatz. Uh, the novel came out in 1929, a radio play. He wrote a radio play in 1930, and there was a film on which he was more peripherally involved in 1931. So he was interested in translating his work, seeing it not only in print, but also translating it into these newest media. Um, just one more thing to talk about, advertisements. There are lots of advertisements suffusing the novel. He wrote in 1919, quote, things are stuck on buildings. A city like this cannot stay silent. It's not enough to speak via trams, cars, hurdy-gurdies. Pedestrians gawk at the walls with pictures, letters. Every third, fourth house bears a sign. The city sweats out its secrets. Um, 10 years later, he writes, quote, advertising is a good contemporary manner of speaking form of speaking for today. Whoever does not take a close look at it, whoever does not employ it, will not be able to capture the big city of the present. I suggest take note of advertising and leave Stefan Georga and Rilke behind. Again, he's saying forget high culture, look at what's around you. Or two years later, Heinrich Mann dares to write about chemistry using the old novelistic style, but it ends up looking like a pedestrian without skates who ventures onto an ice rink. Thomas Mann from the beginning used his immutable style with few options for variation. Today, there are different conditions, economical as well as political. Our voices resound with different words, which reflect a completely new life. Advertising, streets, newspapers. What the Manns write does not interest us anymore. And he was, by the way, friends with Heinrich Mann. Um, so what is he referring to? Let's look at this painting from 1912 of Spittelmarkt which is um, a few blocks away from the Alexanderplatz. Already before World War I, you have colorful ads all over the place. Here at the bottom, you have something very typical of Berlin even today. It's called a Litfas column. It's a circular column on which advertisements are festooned. Here is a newspaper kiosk. Remember, Franz Bieberkopf picks up his papers from a kiosk. And what's being sold there? All sorts of newspapers and magazines. Uh, the walls of houses are plastered with colorful advertisements. And even uh, horse-drawn carriages have advertisements on their side. So even before World War I, uh, you have a city which is festooned with ads. Um, nine years later, Otto Müller uh, paints this painting called Stadt, City. It's obviously influenced by French Cubists and by the Italian Futurists. You can see uh, rooftops, you can see facades, you can see cars. But the city also consists of Ullstein. That's the name of a famous publishing house. Manoli, that's a famous cigarette uh, manufacturer. In other words, advertising also makes up uh, the city, whether, so whether you have something realistic, like the previous painting, or this one, more cubistic, futuristic, advertisements are part of the cityscape. 
and Dublin is translating that into his text. Now, this doesn't mean, though, that you should believe every ad. And he is especially worried about political ads in the early years of the Republic. He writes in 1920, massive numbers of leaflets are distributed in which the craziest things are promised. Posters are glued to pillars and houses. Airplanes and autos are loaded with inflammatory leaflets that are dumped on people to excite and stun them. The most important things are slogans full of affect, imprecise, sparkling words and concepts which act alluringly on brains unused to thinking and seduce people who are not familiar with those issues. He wrote that in 1920. He just as well could have said that in 2020. Um, three years later, in the fall of 23, he writes, the plastering of houses with posters is a barometer for political agitation. Remember, two months later, as I said last month, uh, there was the Scheunenviertel uh, pogrom, and uh, at the same time that Hitler was trying his, attempted his beer hall putsch in Munich. And these are what the political posters looked like. You've got a social democratic poster here. To the left of them was Spartacus. A uh, right-wing liberal party was the Deutsche Volkspartei. The uh, Zentrum was the Catholic party. And of course, you've got parties much further to the right than these as well. Um, so this is the Berlin that Bieberkopf encounters when he gets out of jail. Remember, uh, he, so he's been in jail for four years where everything is quiet, and he gets thrown onto a streetcar, and he's totally befuddled by all of the sights and sounds. At, on the very first page of the novel, you have just the words, Zwölf Uhr Mittags, Zeitung, BZ, Neueste Illustrierte, Die Funkstunde Neu. Um, so what you have to imagine as a reader is that people are, vendors of these newspapers are shouting out the titles. Uh, so you've got the Zwölf Uhr Blatt, which was a, obviously a, a uh, newspaper, popular newspaper sold at noon. The Illustrierte dates back to the 1890s. It was the first, first newspaper uh, with photos, uh, primarily uh, a photo journal. Uh, the Funkstunde was the weekly journal of the Berlin radio station. So these are the the first things that people, one of the, some of the first things that Bibakov hears uh, when he gets out of jail. He gets out uh, of the streetcar on the Rosenthaler Platz. Here's the Rosenthaler Platz about the time that Bibakov is exiting. You can see the streetcar tracks, here's a streetcar there. And what does it consist of? Shops, big advertisements, the way the novel says, shoe stores, hat shops, light bulbs, pubs. Uh, and again, he's totally discombobulated by these. By the way, here's an ad for Löser and Wolf. That's a major tobacco manufacturer. Um, uh, in the novel, twice Löser and Wolf advertisements are cited. Um, then he, you know, he, he lands with the Jews uh, in the Scheunenviertel. They calm him down. Uh, then he gets on his own two feet, and he ends up in a cinema in the Scheunenviertel. Uh, so we're back to movies. I showed you this uh, photo last week. This is an actual cinema that he could have entered, Ibakov could have entered at the time. What attracts him into the cinema? Well, it's a giant red poster. We're back to posters. With a man on the staircase, a swell young girl clung to his legs. She lay on the steps, and the guy above her made a cocky face. Beneath her, the words, uh, beneath the words, without parents, the fate of an orphan child, in six reels. Now, I don't have a poster of that film. It might not even exist. Um, but here's a famous film from 1929 called Asphalt that give you a sense of the movie poster that would have attracted Bibakov into the movie. Now, so he goes into the movie and he's totally turned on sexually. You know, he hasn't had sex in four years. Um, and so then he runs off to the Elsasser Strasse to try to find a prostitute, uh, which he does, uh, but it turns out he's impotent. So one of the problems is that, um, you know, posters can entice you, but they don't necessarily deliver. Um, then Bieberkopf himself starts selling newspapers. He starts out selling gay newspapers. Here you see a male homosexual paper from the time Der Eigene. On the right are two lesbian newspapers. Uh, but that gets him in trouble with his girlfriend of the time, the Polish Lina. So he has to give up selling gay papers. Then he turns to Nazi papers. Franz now sells Völkisch papers. He has nothing against Jews, but he's for order. 
That gets him in trouble then, though, with his drinking buddies, who are all leftists. Um, finally, then, of course, you've got the whole, he joins the Pumps gang, he loses, or rather, he's conned into joining that uh, robbery. He loses his arm. Uh, when he's recovering, he gives up on papers. Franz quietly reads the Motten Post and then the Grüne Post, which he likes best of all because there's nothing political in it. Uh, the Motten Post is an ironic name for the Morgen Post, but what he likes is the Grüne Post, which is totally non political. Now, you know, from the standpoint of the novel, and we can talk about this in the discussion, both attitudes are wrong. I mean, you should not be conned. Dublin is warning the reader not to be conned by all of these messages. But on the other hand, you can't totally pull back from society either. You can't be reading Die Grüne Post all the time. Uh, he's calling more for a, a type of critical engagement on the part of the reader. Um, so, but he, he gets to that point at the end of the novel after having shown how gullible Bibakov is, Bibakov falls for so many things that he shouldn't fall for. So um, just to conclude on two points, I think what Dublin is saying is that you have to look at all of these various messages and media that I mentioned at the very outset, that I listed at the outset, because that's the only way to represent the modern city. A modern city which, I quote from Dublin 1922, it rebels, conspires, broods on the left, broods on the right, demonstrates, renters, landlords, Jews, anti-Semites, the poor, proletarians, warriors in the class struggle, profiteers, seedy intellectuals, small girls, demi monde, high school teachers, parents' associations, trade unions, 2,000 organizations, 10,000 newspapers, 20,000 reports, five truths. The only way to represent this city or even begin to represent it is by drawing upon all of the sources that he does for Berlin Alexanderplatz. Now, my very last point is that. Dublin, though, does this in a non-judgmental way. He presents, he tries not to judge. And the counter model to this non-judgmental voice is the Whore Babylon. The Whore Babylon appears in the Book of Revelations, of course. Um, there's a huge debate among scholars, does Babylon the Whore, in the Book of Revelations, refer to Rome, or to Jerusalem, or to both. We're talking about the first century. But this image of the whore of Babylon gets revived in the modern period as an attack on the big city. And it appears in Fritz Lang's film, Metropolis, from 1927. Um, I personally think it's a terrible film on every level, even though it gets a lot of attention. It's politically very reactionary. Uh, it's very much against metropolitan culture. And it, you know, it too uses this image of the big city as uh, Babylon the whore, you know, sitting on the beast with seven heads, drinking the blood of the virtuous. This is a judgmental counter image of the big city, which Dublin is totally against. And remember, the whore of Babylon repeatedly makes an appearance at the, in the novel, but in the end, she's defeated by death, who uh, teaches. Bibakov to become a new person. And when uh, death wins out, then the whore Babylon has to slink off. So this counter model of the metropolis um, is, gets defeated uh, in the novel itself. 